OK, um, hello everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch this presentation. My name is Tim Griffin. Um, I have a bachelor's in music performance from Reinhardt University in Waleska, Georgia. Um, but until I sign my multi-million dollar recording contract, I am a training compliance coordinator um, for BDUCC as of about um, a month and a half ago. My first day was August 1st. And I found out about this day of collaboration in my first few weeks and was intrigued. I've been able to attend a lot of the sessions today and they've been great. So I'm excited to be able to um, present to you all um, today. Okay, so the saxophone was invented by um, Antoine Joseph Sax. He was born in uh, November of 1814. But from childhood, he went instead by the name of Adolf. I can only assume that the um, the connotation around that name was different in early 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> so his parents also were musicians and inventors. They worked on the French horn. Um, and from a young age, um, Adolf Sax worked on uh, flutes, clarinets, and then later the sax horn, which became the basis for the marching um, euphonium. But undoubtedly, his biggest contribution to the world of music was the saxophone. Um, he also worked on the bass clarinet uh, before um, his participation. It was not widely used. The um, what we call the keyboard, the positioning of the buttons alongside the body of the instrument um, were they didn't make sense. They didn't flow in a manner you might expect. So he revolutionized and redesigned that instrument. And now it's a mainstay of the orchestra more so, in fact, than um, the saxophone ever was. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, um, Adolf Sax had a very difficult life. Um, he had his first bankruptcy only six years after the patent of the saxophone. Um, this was the first of three bankruptcies he would have in his life. He was in a constant battle with his um, economic rivals over his patents, um, people challenging them, trying to make their own versions of the instrument. Um, even as a child, he had multiple near-death experiences. He once drank a bowl of acid that he mistook for milk. He fell three stories out of a window. He was caught in a gunpowder explosion. So a lot of people, that's one of the reasons why the saxophone got the nickname the Devil's Horn was some people say it was cursed from its very beginning. <clears throat> um, so Adolf Sax had a very rough life um, and he would die in poverty in February of 1894 at the age of 80. Um, the saxophone was slow to be accepted by musical culture. Originally, the only pieces written for it were um, just by his own personal friends, people he knew. Um, it, and by the late 1800s, the popularity had severely waned in Europe. But luckily, um, in the early 1900s, it became picked up in America. So um, ragtime and vaudeville music gave way to jazz, bebop, and R&B. And it was revolutionized in America and grew to the popularity it enjoys today. Um, in addition to you know, jazz, R&B, those sorts of things, um, more classical music was written for the saxophone. The preeminent modern composer is named Marcel Mulet. Um, <clears throat> So from you know the humble beginnings of the saxophone, it has now grown to it is sometimes in orchestras, although not super commonly. Um, but it will not be at a church service anytime soon. In 1903, Pope Pius X um, banned it from Catholic church services. And although obviously you could do it, um, that ban was never officially lifted. So um, yeah, it's not going to be at a church service anytime soon. <clears throat> Um, so the saxophone original patent was for um, two different families of seven instruments. So when I say um, families, um, instruments are um, what we call pitched in a different key, right? So we have um, concert pitch is the piano. Everything is based around the piano. Anything else in a different key is called a transposing instrument. And what that means is playing the same named note playing a B flat on a saxophone versus a B flat on a piano will not sound the same. So these are different families of instruments. Half of the saxophones are in B flat, half of the saxophones are in um, E flat. Um, there were also 
there have been C saxophones, but they never really achieved any big popularity. But what's remarkable about the saxophone is that to this day, um, the design is remarkably similar to the original patents, considering it was, you know, 150 years ago. Um, in the 20s to 40s, there were revolutions um, in the design. The uh, bore, which is what we call the inside part of the saxophone, was updated and thinned um, to improve the sound. And then in 1948, um, Selmer, which is one of the largest manufacturers of saxophones, um, instituted what they call the super action keywork, which makes you know the playing of the instrument much smoother and um, more conducive to the sort of pieces that are often written for saxophone, which are often very technical and quick. And that super action keywork remains on saxophones to this day. Um, very little um, changed uh, from that 1948 revision. And so, as I said, the original patent had seven different saxophones. Um, they, as you can see, all vary in size and pitch. So the very smallest and highest pitched is called the um, Sopranino saxophone that's pitched. <clears throat> then we have the soprano saxophone in B flat. The alto saxophone, which is the most common, the most commonly seen is E flat. We have the tenor, the baritone, the bass and the contrabass. Then over here we have two um, oddities. This is called the Soprio or pic Piccolo saxophone, um, S-O-P-R-I-L-L-O. It's less than a foot long. Um, there's only very specific manufacturers for it because of how small and delicate it is. Um, it's expensive <clears throat> and um, like I say, difficult to make, so they're very rarely seen. And next to it here, this is a sub contrabass saxophone, so a half step lower than this one. Um, also called the two backs. So the, the, the bore of the horn is so long that it actually bends um, four times along the length of the instrument. Um, it's about five feet tall. This uh, subcontrabass, since it doesn't bend as often, is um, almost seven feet tall. Okay, so moving on to the parts of the saxophone. So the most important part of these gigantic instruments is this tiny piece of wood, this is called a reed. These are made from reed. Um, there are some made of fiberglass in more recent years. That's what I use, our fiberglass reeds. Um, there are some purists that think the tone is not as good, but um, they're much more cost effective. I mean, one would cost you maybe 20 or $30, but um, if you're playing constantly on these reeds, they break and crack and any imperfections along the edge of the reed will mess with your sound in a significant way. So a fiberglass reed lasts much, much, much longer. <clears throat> so the way that the sound is generated, you have the mouthpiece here and the reed. When you um, impact the end of the reed with your tongue, it makes the reed vibrate back and forth very quickly. Um, it is attached to the mouthpiece. This is a bad example because this is a tenor sax reed and a alto sax mouthpiece, but um, they're held together by what's called a ligature. It's the small piece of metal with these um, screws to hold it in place. So with it being held together down at the bottom here, this top part is allowed to vibrate and that creates resonance inside of the mouthpiece, which then travels down the neck of the horn into the body of the horn. And that's how the sound um, is produced. So one impact from your tongue onto the reed creates vibration into the mouthpiece down through the neck into the body of the horn, and that's how the sound is made. <clears throat> um, an interesting thing about the saxophones is all of them are played the same way. Like for example, um, if you hold down the um, these three fingers of your left hand on these three keys, that's going to be a G on every saxophone. Every saxophone will have a very similar um, key work, and so they're all played the same way. So if you learn, you know what what buttons equal what note on one saxophone, you know them all. However, there are vast differences in what we call the embouchure, which is a word that refers to the shape of your mouth. The higher pitch saxophones require a much tighter one to get uh, a good sound, whereas the lower ones is um, require a looser um, and a lot of breath support to be able to play um, some of the lowest notes. <clears throat> 
OK, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to display, you know, a few things more about how the horn actually works, and then I'm going to play um, one piece really quickly. I selected Georgia on my mind. Um, it was written by Hokey Carmichael. Um, unlike um, popular conception, it was not originally written for Ray Charles. His version came um, later on in the 1960s. It became a Billboard number one hit, um, probably Ray Charles's most famous song, but no, originally written by Hoagie Carmichael on the suggestion of the saxophonist Frankie Trumbauer. Um, he told Hoagie Carmichael, you should write a song about Georgia. And here are the first lyrics, Georgia, Georgia. And he went with it. So now Georgia on my mind is the state song of Georgia ever since 1979. Um, so I'm going to go on um, mute for just a second and get worn back up. And then I'll show a few things about how the saxophone works in practice. And then we'll play the song. So give me just one moment, please. Okay, thank you everybody for your patience. <clears throat> so this, this is my main horn I play. This is a tenor saxophone. Um, this is made by the Unison Company. They were developed in the um, late 80s as they wanted to have a cheaper alternative while still um, having all of what you might expect from one of the larger brands like Selmer. Um, <clears throat> so... As I ben, said, before you before you start, maybe uh, stop sharing so we can get uh, more of you in the screen. Okay, I can do that. I'm sorry, I'm new to Teams. When it says stop sharing, it says that I'll stop presenting. Will that mess us up? No, you're good. Okay. Okay, everybody still with me? Perfect. Okay. <clears throat> so I explained the way that the noise works. So <clears throat> as you can see um, throughout the saxophone, there are all sorts of openings and pressing the different buttons closes and opens these openings, which we call valves. So to create the lowest note on the horn, which is a uh, B flat, the sequence of keys you press close every single valve. So what that does is this, the sound will now travel the full length of the horn. So that's the very that's the lowest it can possibly go. You can create higher pitches, which will involve using the embouchure, which I mentioned earlier. Um, so you can kind of almost force the instrument to make a noise higher than its design intends. Um, but you can't go any lower than B flat because again, the sound is already traveling the full length of the bore. You would need a larger instrument to create a lower pitch than that. <clears throat> Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and run through the song and then we can um, have some questions. Thank you. 
So that George on my mind um, selected just as something um, simple and recognizable. It's a song I really like. <clears throat> um, but that actually is what I had, so I'd be happy to answer um, any questions anyone had. Um, although let me preface it, I'm definitely not an expert. I, I love it, I know a lot about it, but the answer to your question might be, I don't know. <laughs> so be patient for me. Um, so by all means, you can either come off mute or um, just ask in the chat. Um, I saw one question earlier from um, Tim Kelly. Uh, he asks, <clears throat> fascinating that it was banned by the Catholic Church. Was that due to the Devil's Horn moniker? It wasn't because of that, but it didn't help. They kind of went hand in hand um, in that once people heard it had been banned, then the name spread even further. Um, a lot of the reasons for it were stories about Adolf Sachs, who was not well liked by music, by the musical zeitgeist or the, um, you know, just kind of the, you know, the, the stuffed shirts of music of the day. Um, <clears throat> and also just it's it's crazy the things people don't like about the saxophone they don't like the shape they don't like the sound it was it was um the official proclamation used like the word carnal um so yeah it just was never approved of by the church and i think that's a big reason why it never had the wider acceptance in orchestras either um did anyone else have any questions um, I had a question. Um, is the saxophone as an instrument, can like people that are right-handed or left-handed uh, play, is it ambidextrous? Yes. Um, well, let me, I know people of, that are left-handed and right-handed that play it, but it's not ambidextrous in that there's not, like every saxophone ever made, you have your left hand up here and your right hand down here. So if you, if you were, um, you know, left-handed in such a way that you just couldn't do it like that, then you couldn't. It's just not, it's just not made like that. But <clears throat> like I said, I knew a few people in college that were left-handed that can play it. Um, but no, I don't believe there's a, like a specific left-handed saxophone. That's a, that's a good question though. Hey. Tim, I have a question. Um, I looking at, um, say, I, I think you called it the, so Perillo, the teeny tiny one, the 12 foot uh, yes. saxophone um, and comparing it against something like, say, a flute or a piccolo. Do you think there's much difference in sound besides like the orientation on how you hold the instrument? Um, the piccolo is still going to be higher pitched um, because of how small and thin it is. They're about the same length, but they are similar. Um, so, yeah, the Soprillo's nickname is the piccolo saxophone because they're sort of aiming for the same um, uh, what they call timbre, the mute, the uh, color of the sound. So in what um, you know, there are saxophone orchestras or saxophone ensembles in which all the participants just pay, play different members of the family. That's the role that's assigned to it is, you know, the role of the flute or the piccolo up at the very top of the register. That's cool. And that was the really big um, saxophone. Does that have to be supported on a stand in order for someone to play that? I've never seen that one before. Yes. So um, the the baritone saxophone, which is half a step lower than this, it's maybe four or five inches longer, and the neck sort of wraps around. That's the biggest one that people generally carry around. Any lower than that, so we have the bass, the contrabass, and then the gigantic one is the sub contrabass. They have a small peg with a rubber foot that comes down from this, and then it sits on the floor between your legs like that, and it's played in front of you. The other saxophones are commonly played off to the side, like I did. But yeah, those larger ones, um, the two back sets made by the uh, German manufacturer Benedict Eppelsheim is 50 pounds, um, so no one could play you know a full concert supporting that weight and also trying to have the breath support from the diaphragm to fill that thing up with sound and make the notes that are the whole point of having the instrument that big thank you and do you have examples of like um concerts or classical concerts that have saxophone in them just out of curiosity 
Sure, um, that's something I can add to the chat later on. I can find some good examples. Yeah, there are definitely. So like I said in the presentation, um, like a normal piece for um, for orchestra would not include um, a saxophone part. So some do when it's specifically called for. And then what also happens is it'll be like a specific saxophone solo part. So the orchestra would be accompanying, you know, a virtuoso saxophonist on a specific part. Um, and there have been examples of that throughout. So I, I would I would love to drop some um, in the chat later on. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Tim, it seems like the saxophone found its found a home in jazz. Uh, is there is there a reason for that? You know, I I don't know if you ever um, uh, you may be a little young for this, but there used to be a great jazz bar in Atlanta called Dante's Down the Hatch. And, you know, and I think about, you know, great sax being there, you know, sometimes a piano, sometimes a bass, but but always the sax is the instrument. So any any reason why why that? Um, I'm not sure exactly what it is that makes mm -hmm. um, the saxophone and jazz go hand in hand so well. Mm -hmm. um, some people theorize, so of all instruments, the um, the alto saxophone specifically close, most closely matches um, a human voice, like in terms of the range that most people can sing. So some people think that's why it has the, the popularity is it just like if you, you know, if you're just playing in a bar and you only have the money for one or two instruments and then people singing, maybe a drum kit, you know, that's going to fit in nicely. Some people liked that. And it just <clears throat> was always popular with black culture. And so was jazz. So they just, like I say, just kind of went hand in hand. It's it's almost, um, they just came up together um, because the saxophone's popularity came, you know, just right alongside with the development of vaudeville and ragtime turning into jazz and then to R&B. Very cool. All right, um, I think it's about time for the next session, but I can um, if anyone had one last question before we go. Curious, did you play, uh, you, you know, you've you obviously play the sax. Did you play in, you know, like a marching band or band or do you do you have anything going on the side? Um, now, now I'm curious, having uh, having been exposed to your talent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I started playing the summer after my sixth grade year, so I would have been um, 11 years old and then I played um, middle school, high school um, and college. And then um, afterwards I taught private lessons. I did a little bit of composing, but I have not I have not really played um, in a long time. And this was actually kind of dusting it off uh, just because I was excited to talk about it. But um, but yeah, yeah, I, I played for a long time um, and I love it. Um, it's it's a wonderful hobby. I, I would recommend to anyone try to pick up an instrument. Um, it's very rewarding. Um, it's just fun to be able to have, you know, a talent and an outlet like that. I thought, like I said, I would, I would recommend it to anyone.